we can get started. And there we go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Senate Education. It is March 25th, Thursday at 2.45 p.m. Uh, just quickly, uh, a little housekeeping. Um, S100, uh, I know some of you uh, have heard, others I, I may have been in contact with. Uh, the short of it is that we, um, a few of us met yesterday and the path forward looks like it is going to have some more time. Uh, it'll be on the floor, as you heard, until April 1st. But Senate Agriculture is going to look at financing and try to get, uh, you know, a, maybe a different path forward uh, financially than the one that um, initially was outlined. So they're looking at a different number of different uh, ideas. As I believe I mentioned, ESSER funds cannot be used. Uh, for this, but is it possible that at the school district level, um, they could work with their budgets in a certain way um, to do some of this work? Uh, could we could we start to do this work just you know more incrementally? Um, so those are some of the kinds of questions that they're going to be asking themselves and working with the agency of education. And I told uh, Senator Starr that we're here to to help uh, after he gets started, but. Um, uh, that's where things are at this point. So uh, any questions on that? Okay, great. So today we are talking about returning to a topic that we've had some time on in this committee, and that is the topic of civic education. And uh, I, we had back in January um, when we were starting to look at this topic, uh, we had a lineup of people that were going to come in, uh, but given schedules and uh, other pressing issues, if you will, um, we needed to postpone until today. So I very much appreciate everyone that is here. Uh, I think we're going to have a lively, interesting conversation. To frame it a little bit, um, I believe, and I think I'm speaking for everyone on the committee, we want, we want to see, you know, understand first and foremost what we're doing out there in the state around civic education and whether or not there are areas that we as the legislature should take action, um, if action is needed, to make improvements in civic education. So to that end, we, we invited the agency in and we're going to start with the agency. I know um, both uh, Martha Dice and uh, Jess uh, DeCarolis are with us. Uh, and we've asked them to tell us a little bit, give us a little bit of what is happening on the ground, uh, K through 12, and what they see perhaps as needs that the legislature can help with. We are then going to hear from former state representative Ann Book, who served on uh, a task force on civic education when she was in the legislature. And then uh, the highlight is, uh, not that everyone else is in a highlight, but a particular highlight is uh, Mr. Henshin and his students, all of whom are here to talk about some of their work on the ground in civic education. So with that, unless I see questions, I think I'm going to turn it over to uh, Martha and Jess. And thank you both for being with us. Really appreciate it. We know the two of you are working incredibly hard uh, on a number of different fronts and really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. So the floor is yours. Well, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for having us. And, and I do wanna just say, I'm gonna stay off camera because I've been having uh, connection issues all day and it's very possible you will lose me most likely mid sentence. Um, but for the record, my name is Jessica Carolis. I'm division director of student pathways at the agency of education. And I'm going to let my colleague introduce herself. Hi, I'm Martha Dice. I'm the Global Citizenship Specialist at the Agency of Education. And I think uh, what we're following up on is we, I think we provided testimony on January 21st where we did uh, give an overview of the sort of regulatory framework and, and standards related to civics education and particularly civics education in a proficiency-based system. And uh, what we said we would do is, is go back and, and get some more detailed information about uh, what courses might look like. We had had an initial scan through the SLDS of some courses, just to give you some insight. And then also to make some recommendations about 
what are what are initiatives or actions um, that we can take beyond sort of the legislative uh, solution, right? Because we, we know in legislation that's um, it's one tool and it, it can be a very rough tool and we already have standards in place, state adopted standards. And so how can we move towards that implementation that will uh, improve outcomes for students in the, the state? So I'm gonna try to share my screen. Um, oh, it looks like I'm disabled. Okay, Liz will, I think, be able to help you with that. And I believe also Mr. Henshin is going to uh, need to be able to co-host as well when his time is up. Uh, but let me also, Jess, if you'd be so kind, only because January seems like 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you could just uh, mention maybe where we can find the standards again, or perhaps after this, just uh, direct us uh, to those standards so that as we're making our way through this, we just were as fluent and up to date as, as possible. A absolutely, and uh, can folks see my screen? Yes, perfectly. So I was uh, anticipating that you like all, <laughs> like us uh, probably can't remember what happened yesterday. Um, <laughs> I have the links to the previous testimony at the top Terrific. That both gives civics education and context and then our reflections on, on S-17 as it was Great. written. Thank you. Um, sure, absolutely, totally get it. So, you know, um, what we did is we, we, we said that we would engage in sort of two activities. One is that we wanted to get a qualitative scan. So we surveyed curriculum directors through the, um, through VICLA, which is the Vermont Curricul Curriculum Leaders Association. And while we had a small number of respondents, some um, seven uh, supervisory unions were represented because we had closed, we had a tight window. We thought we were testifying again. So we sort of yeah. closed that. Um, and, and that really gives us a, a qualitative sense of uh, what folks are doing. So all res respondents stated that civics and or civics concepts are taught within their supervisory unions or supervisory districts. The concepts that are outlined in um, the bill, constitutional government, human rights, individual rights, inalienable rights, and voting are taught within each responding SUSD. And most reported that other concepts such as popular sovereignty, natural rights, classical republicanism, and social contract theory are also taught. And, and that's not exhaustive, that's just sort of an example. Um, all SUSDs reported that the US Constitution, as well as principles of judicial review, checks and balances, and federalism are taught. And all respondents, um, reported extended civic learning opportunities are available. So, you know, across the K-12 continuum, extended learning opportunities and civic engagement activities such as student council and volunteering and uh, service learning, community service are available. And we know that because uh, Act 77 outlines ex um, extended learning opportunities as a flexible pathway, I thought it was important and we had spoken about that before, which is learning is not bound by time or buildings and students are engaging in, in um, developing civic literacy even outside of a, a classroom or a, a mandata mandated class. We then wanted to get to sort of that quantitative <laughs> component. So we did an expanded uh, SCED code scan and that stands for school codes for the exchange of data, which is something that you like to talk about on a Friday night over a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. um, and working with our, our data division and again, this is a rough instrument. Um, so I would say that this gives you a snapshot, but we would have to spend a lot more time digging into that if we were, if you wanted um, something much more refined. But based on those, the descriptive information um, within the SCED codes, pulling up from the statewide longitudinal data system, we were, you know, and, and this is inclusive of classes, for instance, like straight up civics and government, but also, you know, and I see we have a, uh, Abenaki and local history, American heritage, American history in a global context, re restorative justice, women in the White House, etc. So the names, of course, is, uh, are always indicative of the, the content within them uh, and doesn't really specify, but in their descriptions might be getting at some of these civic concepts. So in fiscal year 20, there were 26,704 enrollments in social studies classes of varying length and credit type, and meaning semester, year long, or quarter credit. And there were 10,821 unique students enrolled in social studies classes. So, you know, you have a very big percentage of students every year engaging in courses that are delivering um, civic content. Jess, uh, everybody else may know this, but what, what's a, uh, when you say unique students? 
meaning we're not duplicating students. So sometimes people will, you know, the oh, enrollments, yeah. you could have, oh, you know, one student who's taken two classes. So two enrollments count for one unique student. So that is a, that's a clear cut number. Um, we're yeah. not duplicating students. Um, so I'm gonna now turn it over to Martha, who's going to um, take us through the state activities to support civic literacy. Right, so when we were here in January, I, um, you all had asked for some suggestions that were um, without cost as to what the legislator might be able to do to increase civic engagement and civic involvement. So we put together um, some ideas of what the legislator, legislature can do as well as what the AOE could do to support civic opportunities. Um, a lot of it is overlapping and collaborative, um, which is great. There are things that are community focused, like y'all can go on, but why, you know, and answer the tough questions posed by elementary students, um, uh, or also volunteer with the Historic Commission on the 250th anniversary the, of the nation, which is a really um, monumental project that we're starting already. Um, supporting vo voter registration, is actually one of the pillars of the Center for American Progress that testified after we did in January um, of something that would support strong civic learning. Um, and then, you know, volunteering in classrooms and volunteering for educational opportunities like Mock Trial and Vermont History Day, We the People, um, things like that. Um, and there's also, a national civic legislation page that keeps state civic resources. So that could be um, the, the state resource page regarding civic education could be beefed up to, to be a little bit more than just um, how a bill becomes a law and um, you know the committee work. Um, in regards to the agency of education with the field, we could develop um, PK-12 sample curriculum, civics related curriculum that could be housed on our AOE website. We could be providing professional development for PK-12 educators. Um, we also would be able to call resources and lessons that would be aligned with um, the C3 state adopted standards as well as the PBGRs that were developed by the field. And this is something similar if you're aware of the big national rollout about three weeks ago uh, from the US Department of Education, Harvard and the National Humanities Council. It's something very similar. Um, also an inquiry based program and they called resources for educators um, to be able to use easily. Um, and also we have the partnership with the PBS and PBS learning media. And there are a lot of kits that we've developed. And, you know, it's great because we really need that uh, elementary school focus because social studies education's often been lacking nationwide in the elementary school ages. Um, so just some ideas of things that can be done that are um, not um, cost prohibitive that you know, the legislature can do and the AOE can do, and we could do uh, collaboratively as well. And so I'm gonna start stop sharing and, and then, you know, we have some other things that we wanna talk about, but I think at one point you'd also asked about uh, world languages. So just wanted to let sure. folks know that we added some information here at the bottom. We don't need to testify on that today, but uh, you know, for your review and if okay. you have questions, we can follow up. Thank you. Um, it, you know, and I, I think previously what we had um, spoke of and, and what we would recommend is, is really focusing on implementation. Um, my, my concern is that frequently from year to year, what we find is that we, we pass legislation and then the next year we're either seeking to undo that legislation, right? Or improve upon it. And I, I worry, generally, and then particularly as we're going into a sort of recovery phase um, coming out of the pandemic, that we, we need to give schools the space and time to invest in implementation efforts versus in uh, designing new responses to new legislation. And, you know, there are unintended consequences because uh, I think that it's a very strong signal to say we value civic education by mandating 
the passing of a civics education class, but to the degree that we know that for students to internalize their learning, it, it requires application and application in novel situations independently, that we can perhaps move away from that, that focus of truly internalizing and becoming uh, civically engaged and having civic literacy because we turn it into some sort of mandated course that might be disruptive, particularly in a proficiency-based system. I think I'd also sent in a follow-up email and I, I, I put this forward, not because it, it means that we can sit back on our heels, but because I do think it's important for us to reflect that on the Center for American Progress, you know, we have the highest uh, US government AP mean score in the nation. And so I, I just want to also say that it's important to recognize when our educators and our students are doing well. And while that's a very small snapshot and that should not be a sole reflection of what students know and can do, it does mean that there are educators in the state who are doing something right um, and that that should be applauded. And I would also say that we know that the interdisciplinary nature of being, you know, a, a good citizen goes beyond just civics class, right? We know that media literacy, right, yeah. is required because we know how we engage as a citizen is influenced by how easily we're manipulated uh, and understand how to navigate media. We know that, uh, you know, being, uh, having, having civic literacy also can impact our ability to be financially literate and vice versa. So, you know, we, we have multiple literacies at play and I know that, you know, there is a, a bill in play around literacy, big L literacy. And, and so thinking about even our literacy levels and how that impacts our ability to consume information and engage as a, as a citizen, um, it, it's all interconnected. And I would be worried about the unintended consequence of having a mandated course that might um, not only impact the ability to engage in those interdisciplinary uh, learnings, but also might stymie some creativity that we're seeing at the local level. I think your comment about the interconnectedness of everything is, is key. So that was great. Um, I appreciate knowing the AP scores. Is, are, is AP uh, history, American history offered at every school, every high school in the state? Uh, it's not offered at every school in the state, but I can certainly get you a list of where it's offered. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. You know, the schools and just generally numbers, uh, that would be really helpful, I think, to all of us to have a sense of, of that. And that's kind of thing has been on our mind in terms of offerings as we made our way through the weighting uh, implementation plan as well. You know, what could schools do? What, you know, how can we make sure that everybody gets to the point at some point of having, you know, all the kinds of offerings out there that, they want to take. Uh, those are all great comments from both of you. Uh, committee, uh, questions, comments? And Jess and Martha, if I cut either of you off, feel free also to, to add anything else. Okay. Um, let me see, I think my only comment question really was the one around AP offerings. Um, and uh, yeah, great. Yeah, Senator Chinden, did you have your hand up? Uh, I can make a comment. So this is great. And uh, one thing I, I wanna bring back to this civics discussion is just how do we uh, get the populace at large, the electorate to engage in civics, not necessarily just our high school seniors and juniors. Uh, and how do we use our schools to uh, offer adult education civics classes or things like having elections local and state be on Saturdays or making state elections a state holiday. But I know that's not why all of you are here from the Department of Education. But in this discussion about civics, that's where my mind keeps going is I don't think we're going to address the problems of January 6th uh, by just adding a new high school requirement. I think there is more of a larger conversation to be had about having an informed electorate. Yeah, and a real, you know, how can we, we've talked about this in committee, a real cultural shift, um, cultural shift in, in all of this. And, you know, one of the things we kept in mind, uh, I don't remember, it wasn't me, but one of my colleagues on this committee kept, uh, you know, it in mind when we were creating one of the advisory committees or councils in one of uh, the bills 
to make certain that students were there. I believe it was a school discipline bill, uh, advisory council, it might've been Senator Perchlick. And, you know, again, having students involved in some of the work that we are producing, uh, summer studies, that kind of thing, I think can, can really be helpful. Uh, Senator Hooker, please. Um, I, I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. And I'm pleased with all of the resources that the agency has. Uh, my concern is that it's it could be a shotgun approach. Uh, and as you know, uh, Senator Chittenden was commenting on sort of educating the populace, how do we ensure that all kids have some exposure as they go through school? And it doesn't have to be a particular class, a single class. I don't know whether it's, you know, sort of electives, but I don't know, you know, I guess we don't get into electives with pre-K and uh, K through 12, but uh, my concern is that some kids may get all the way through without having um, enough exposure to um, civics and the you know the concerns that we have in our societies. Yeah, you know I, I appreciate that. I mean I, I think that's the the thing that um, keeps us up at night <laughs> in our roles at the agency of education. And I I, I do want to uh, recommend you know going back to our our previous testimony because there is a, a backbone which is the C three standards and then proficiency-based graduation requirements and our education quality standards, which are the rules that govern education, also speak specifically about what is required content to be taught and that's inclusive of uh, civic concepts within social studies. Um, but to this question about what's enough, you know, and, and it's hard because, um, you, you know, I, particularly now I'm sure that everybody is feeling an urgency for like a quick solution, you know, something that we could put in place that would just sort of like fill the gap. But if we were to do a root cause analysis and, and why is it that all students aren't getting what they need when they need it, you know, we're, we're gonna be digging down deeper into, you know, how is our education system structured? You know, um, what is the difference between being in a public school versus a approved independent school in which there are two sets of accountability systems? What, what does it mean if we are resourced differently? We have different staffing structures, we have different pay scales. I mean, there's all sorts of things that I think can contribute to that, yeah. um, let alone in a pandemic when we're talking about predictable broadband access and being able to engage in remote learning activities either during or not during a pandemic. Um, but I do think that if we, if we allow for schools, if we have that backbone around the standards and then provide the supports and the space for schools to implement and develop those coordinated curricula that, that connect and provide for those both, uh, you know, discipline specific and interdisciplinary approaches, I think we can go a long way. And then I think what we've provided are some opportunities in which we could uh, support schools and those extended learning opportunities that allow for students, students like who are sitting here to engage in that extended learning and application. Um, you know, and then again, our accountability system, so our education quality review process by which we are holding, you know, schools accountable. Y you know, um, I, I, I can't stress enough that um, now more than ever, I think it would be really important that we provide a foundation by which schools can um, rebuild uh, and recover, as opposed to perhaps putting something that is incredibly well-intentioned and important um, in their path that might be disruptive to some of those recovery efforts. Yeah. Senator Hooker, did you have a follow-up to that? I'm all set, thank you. Senator thank Lyons. You. So thank you very much. Um, the Your presentation was very helpful. And those of us who have had kids who've gone through uh, some really excellent um, programs in their, in, our, in their schools. Uh, I think we understand what it, you're doing and how, and how well it is done in many of the schools across the state. As you're talking, I'm thinking about some of my own experiences with some of the Mideast countries and with, um, uh, through the uh, World Affairs, Organization of World Affairs, where people have come to our country to meet with people like me 
uh, uh, including folks from Yemen and the Congo and, and other, um, both African and Asian countries and Mid Mideast countries. And the conversation is, uh, is <laughs> what is our democracy? And, and what is it and how does it work? And it, that is such a penetrating question when you try to explain to um, someone from Yemen what democracy is. So you can begin by saying, well, you, you're selected, uh, you get picked in a vote to be on the select board and then you make all the decisions for the town and, and other towns are doing the same thing. And, but then the, the question is, well, how, how does that work? So for me, when you're, as you're talking, I, I think what whoever said it, uh, it's the culture but democracy is a culture. Mm. And so then we think about who's in charge. In a school, the kids are not in charge. The school, the model for the kids is a top-down model. Mm. There's, no, there's no democracy in the classroom unless it's a unique environment. There's no, the, the principal is the leader and makes the decisions, right? That's not a democracy. So I guess the question is how do we how do we uh, um, put in place that little democratic process and build that culture when we are, the model that we're embedded in is not a democratic model. So then I say, uh, you know, then I ask the question, well, gee whiz, you know, how, uh, you know, my favorite expression is golly Ned, how come we don't have some kind of a little pilot program, you know, and uh, why don't we, why don't we allow for some independent democratic process within a school or a group within a school and do something different? And, and it doesn't matter who the kids are. They don't have to be the star pupils, but they could be all the kids from uh, all the, all the groups in school, because we know there's still groups in school. So I, I'm trying to sort out, uh, you know, the, the, the need for civics education and having people involved when they grow up and they start voting and participating, if there hasn't been that model for them from the get-go. So mm. uh, yeah. help me understand that. Well, first of all, I, I'd like to say that um, I, I, I think you've asked <laughs> uh, one of the sort of more complicated questions that I really appreciate it. And I, I feel like um, this could take, take us into the weekend, uh, but uh, to not take us into the weekend because we have folks who, who are here to testify. I would say that this is where thinking about, you know, uh, legislation around personalized learning and our proficiency-based learning, et cetera, comes into play. Personalized learning, one of the, the five essential characteristics is student agency, right? And, and how do we start to develop that student agency and that autonomy in which, you know, students are making decisions about uh, what they're learning, how they're being assessed, you know, how they can demonstrate their learning, um, indicating their interests, maintaining personalized learning plans, which really should be the foundation for their professional presence as adults in the real world, because we all have them, whether it's LinkedIn accounts, et cetera. I, but I, I think to this question about democracy is even even in our democracy, right? So you know, you and I can't necessarily um, declare war, uh, and and so there are roles and responsibilities that are attuned to different positions and bodies. And I would want to be able to disaggregate how do we embed that student-centered learning approach in which students are active participants in their learning and are engaged in activities like being on the school board being on the State Board of Education, being in uh, school councils or student councils in which they're uh, determining activities um, and, and decisions and engaging in policy making. But at the same time, you know, to recognize that adults also have a responsibility in school, you know, that they can't abdicate that fundamental responsibility and that that might be that they are engaging in, in a scaffolded way as you move across the grade bands uh, in being uh, an instructor and then a facilitator of learning over time. Um, and I wouldn't want it to be seen that um, if students can't make some decisions in the classroom, that that's because it's, it's not part of a democracy, but rather that it's, it's a 
understanding of the roles and responsibilities of, of the professionals who are in the building. Um, but you're right, you know, there's many ways that we could be modeling it and in thinking about how do we model it in policy uh, that's, you know, um, representative of our core values. <clears throat> Okay. Can I, uh, can I Martha, just quickly add? Yeah. Yeah. That um, in the C3 standards that were adopted um, by the state board in 2017, there is a, um, a category called participation and deliberation, applying civic virtues and democratic principles. I mean, and it goes all the way down to um, indicators that, that students should be able to um, be proficient in by kindergarten um, in, in regards to specific democratic principles of equality and fairness and responsibility. Um, and you can get those things really organically through, you know, when, when students are allowed to, to participate in what the class rules should be or in, you know, who are the line leaders and, and you know, leaders for the week and things like that. So it starts at a really early age. Um, and I think, you know, school elections and all of those things are really strong models of democratic principles at the classroom and school level. I don't want to keep going. Yeah. Um, can the two of you stay with us for a little while while we hear from others? Is that possible? I'm looking to sure. North and Jess. Okay, terrific. Um, then let's move on to uh, uh, Ann Mook and, and our students, but we'll start with former state representative Ann Mook, who uh, reached out to me uh, indicating that she would uh, like to weigh in on this subject. She was part of a, and I'll let Ann describe it, a civic education task force when she was in the legislature. So uh, with that, uh, Representative Mook. For the record, um, I'm Ann Mook. And um, I served for six years on the House Education Committee and then four years um, in GovOps. Um, I have a passion for civics and couldn't let, let this bill go by without some comment. Um, in about 10 years ago, um, I chaired a task force. And for the life of me, since I've talked to um, Senator Campion, um, I can only come up with a couple of names of people who served on that committee. M most of them um, were non-legislative, but people within the um, statewide civics, uh, history, democracy, um, um, places that were having successful programs from around the state and along with former Bob Paolini um, from the Vermont Bar, um, we had this task force. Um, because we ran out of time at the end of a session, um, it went no further. And um, just to let you know, for those who don't know me, is I have a background as a teacher, um, as I, a coach, I've worked with um, a lot of young people and staff of different ages in, in the field of recreation. Though my task force notes are long gone, <laughs> um, my memory that of the things that were strong um, outcomes of our task force are still in my mind. And so when I speak about some of our findings, I'm weaving those findings into, um, and in, into suggestions. Um, <clears throat> as we all know, as we have campaigned over the years, we are alarmingly aware that much of the general public do not know what the legislature does, the branches of government, how a bill is created, and the process to become law, what an individual's rights are, what democracy is, and how US democracy differs from other countries in the world. Unless a student has a dedicated teacher that includes some of those above information in a course, 
those graduating students do not know how to register to vote, why it's important, or even what a ballot looks like. Or perhaps they would invite you as the a senator or a house member to come and do a special day in a classroom to talk about what you do. Jess says it very well. There are concepts mentioned in the quantitative um, scan that are very important and are right on the mark. But I implore you, as we as a task force said years ago, to pass a strong civics bill that would require students to take a civics and democracy class in either ninth or 10th grade, no substitutions. This would include all independent and religious schools and tech schools that are not connected to a district high school. One of the outcomes of the task force was that some districts were doing an outstanding job with a required civics class. Others, it was an, was an elective. <clears throat> they offered it, but it was an elective. And it had maybe only one semester a year. So that it is possible to have an outcome of only 25 or 50 students graduate from high school with a real understanding of civics and democracy. They have, they are entering our voting market that have never seen a ballot, developed critical thinking skills in relation to determining false facts. You talked about literacy. We Re, um, realize the impact of social media on democracy. What are citizens' responsibilities? knowing the branches of government, why there's a constitution and how it was formed and what's in it and limited state of Vermont history. And they don't know who the world leaders are. The task force found that where civics was an elective, there were courses on history that students were allowed to take. They could take history of the Holocaust, they could take a world history class pre-1700 and they could all be substituted for civics. I don't think you as a committee need to legislate another task force. My suggestion would be to go home and sit with principals in your area high schools and find out how curriculum of history courses are determined. This will give you the, the information to finalize your bill. What are the requirements that are required in, in, their, in that particular high school's um, civics class? It has been two generations since civics has been required in some districts. There are some that are doing a great job. We found that some history departments, the staff sit down and decide who, what teachers are gonna teach what history class that year. That what if a department has a teacher that has not taken a civics course in their college curriculum? If young people are taking civics, their parents will also learn with them reaching two generations. It's a, a domino effect, making them better citizens and participating in our communities. That is a good outcome. So I at, urge the AOE to take this very seriously. Um, it, again, it's a domino effect. Our society is a worldwide community with government, business, agriculture, energy, health issues, to name a few. And democracy only works when we have an informed and educated citizenry and knowledge has an impact on our actions and reactions. The future of this state 
and country are dependent on the understanding of one's vote and knowledge in how it impacts everything. And I personally would like to have the committee take a look at all of the Vermont State College curriculum to see if we're asking our AOE to put together the specifics of civics, are we getting backed up at the college level? So if, a, if, they, if the college courses, if they offer a civics class, is it required for education majors, history majors, graduate students? Is it available for teachers that are trying to update their curriculum? Whether S-17 or House 216 moves forward, I thank you for your commitment to civics. I wanna thank Senator McCormick for an instituting seven, uh, Senate 17 and to the Senator from Bennington um, for allowing me to come before you. The last thing I wanna say is that implementation we need to give it three years so that not only can school districts and the, and the education department work together in making this a uniform um, reach for, for communities. So that, those are my comments. Um, some of them are personal. Some of them were um, outcomes of the, the task force. Thank you, Representative. Uh, committee members, uh, <clears throat> before we move on to Mr. Henshin and his students, any questions for uh, Representative Mook? And Representative Mook, we're hoping that you can also stay on if possible and, and hear from uh, Matt and his students. Okay. Because other qu questions may pop up after that. Will you tell, announce to us where they're from? Yep, we'll start in just a minute. I'm just okay. waiting to see if there's there are any questions. Okay, Mr. Henshin uh, and students, uh, hearing from all of you is incredibly important to this process. Uh, and we're so glad that you are all willing and have made the time to be with us today. Uh, I am going to turn the floor over to, uh, to Matt and Matt, I'll let you then turn the floor over to your students and you can all introduce yourselves uh, in whatever way you would like. But uh, thanks for being with us. So with that, and you're muted just so you know, Matt. There you go. All right, yeah, thank you very much. Um, you know, I think I'm, I'm really, I really am hoping that, that Anne, you can stick around, um, Martha um, and, and Carol, I believe, um, because I would love to sort of like talk through and address some of the issues that you guys brought up. I think you'll see in some of our testimony that we, we tend to align in many ways. Um, I would say that the, the one place where I would not align is, um, you know, if you really wanna know what's being taught, you gotta go to the teachers. Um, principals are busy, curriculum coordinators are busy, and you really gotta go to the teachers um, to really know what's, what's really being taught. Um, so just a, quick piece before we get started. But so my name is Matt Henshin and I'll do a more, um, I'll do an introduction to my piece. Um, we were gonna be kind of short and sweet and I, I created a prepared piece because I've never really done this before and I figured it'd be better to just sort of read a prepared piece. Um, and in my piece, I'll, I'll quickly um, introduce the students and then they can introduce themselves after, um, they'll be speaking after I speak. So again, my name is Matt Henshin. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. And I've been a teacher for 15 years in the great state of Vermont. I'm really, truly honored to be invited to speak with you today. Um, and particularly, particularly to be in partnership with a few of Vermont's amazing young people, um, Uma, Maya, Maya, who will be joining us later, and Mary. Uh, I have an enormous amount of respect for the work that you do. And I'm honored to be part of the history and traditions of the Vermont legislature. I've sat in the State House many times supporting students as they testify, but this is the first time I've been in front of the microphone, and I must say it gives me a greater appreciation for the students who have gone before me. I wish we were all in that beautiful building together, 
but it is the work and not the building that is sacred. Uh, over the next few minutes, I'll be sharing my evolution as a civics teacher with the hope that it will illuminate and put into greater perspective some of the issues that S17 uh, was designed to address. So I grew up in, the, in Western New York, south of Rochester. I moved to Vermont in 1997 and eventually earned a bachelor's degree at Johnson State. As a recent graduate, I was given an amazing opportunity to teach a college level online social studies course for CCV uh, by my dear friend and former professor, John Christensen. On the way to the job interview, a semi-trailer truck swerved in front of me and caused a head-on collision. We were both fine, but I showed up at the interview um, with a torn shirt and some blood on my, my collar. Uh, it was pretty embarrassing, but after explaining what happened, John told me, go to the hospital, get checked out, you got the job. Anybody that's willing to show up after head-on collision clearly deserves this. Um, so I taught a first course online. I don't even honestly remember which the first one was, but over the next few years, he, he asked me to teach more online courses and I taught sociology, psychology, anthropology, ethnic studies, global studies, US history. Um, eventually I got a bit frustrated and I said, listen, why won't you ever let me teach the same course twice? Um, I put all this work into developing a curriculum and uh, you know, it would be nice to just kind of cruise a little bit. And he looked at me and said like, he said basically, well, how will you learn all the things you need to learn? He said, the problem with teachers these days is they just don't know enough content. And more importantly, they don't know how to put it together in a way that helps students understand. Um, you know, I learned two things from John. I learned that content is important. Students cannot Google things that they're not even aware of. Um, and I learned that the best way to learn content is by teaching or performing. Um, I ended up at UVM in a master's degree program for history with a goal of becoming a college professor. However, after talking to a few of my professors I began to, take, uh, began to take a more serious look at teaching at the high school level. They knew I loved Vermont, and they also knew how, how few opportunities there were for college professors in the state. And so I made the shift. Um, I decided to go to St. Michael's College because of the strong reputation it has. And it was there that I was exposed to the ideas of the famous Vermonter John Dewey. Um, and those ideas really, really affected me. Uh, I grew up in New York State. Um, with a Regents Diploma. And although we had a 19th century health sanatorium, like literally out the window of the school and a Native American graveyard uh, 100 yards from the school, we never once used either of those in a history class. Instead, it was lecture, test, and quizzes. And um, Dewey, you know, John Dewey teaches us that education is not preparation for life. Education is life. Um, and so after a year of student teaching at Rice uh, or student teaching at Rice and a part-time position there, I was fortunate enough to, to acquire a job at Harwood in 2007. Um, I've been teaching there ever since. And I'm here today actually because of two events that took place over 10 years ago today. Um, the first event, I was teaching a course called History on Film and we had explored a new documentary, Michael Moore film that came out called Sicko, um, which explored uh, healthcare systems around the world. And one of the students said, is it really true that America is the only country that has no universal healthcare system? And one of the other students said, that's not true. And I said, well, it, it, you know, it is in fact true. And a couple of the kids were a little angry about that. And they said, that's ridiculous. Like why, you know, why can't we do something like that? And we, just to be clear, we followed the film with a frontline documentary called Sick Around the World, which looked at how every healthcare system has problems, right? There's no perfect system. But they were frustrated. And I said, what do you think you can do about it? Um, none of the kids raised their hands. And I said, listen, the bell's about to ring. I, I didn't wanna see two hands go up. So two hands shoot up. I asked the first kid, he says, I don't know, you just told me I had to put my hand up. So I asked the second kid and they said, listen, the only thing you can do is get a good job. And I said, well, what about, you know, calling your politicians, your local lawmakers? What about getting active politically? And what, what happened was really kind of shocking. The, pretty much the entire class, regardless of class or ethnicity or gender, pretty much the whole, it was just a barrage of all politicians are corrupt. They're all the same. The system doesn't work. Nobody cares. There's no point. And it really shocked me because what I, what I thought I was doing was by helping students understand problems, I thought that they would be inspired and motivated to change. 
And in fact, what I was just teaching was a curriculum of cynicism and disengagement. And it wasn't working. Um, I went home that very same day and I picked up my son um, and my stepdaughter with my, my wife. And she asked the question, she saw some political signs on the screen, or sorry, on the street. And it was during the Brian Doobie, Peter Shumlin um, election. And we used to ask kids about questions about politics because it was just hilarious to see what they would say. So my wife um, asked my son, you know, hey, who do you think we should vote for? And I actually happened to share a video, get a video of it. And I want to show you guys my seven-year-old. So hopefully you guys can hear this. Let me know. Somebody give me a thumbs up if you can. In the run up race, I asked my seven-year-old son who he thought I should vote for, Brian Doobie or Peter Shumlin. This is how he responded. So can you guys hear that okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Brian Doobie doesn't know about health care, and he might kill at least one baby. And Peter Shumlin voted four times What's for, for um, us to pay at least $1 trillion a month. And where did he get all of that useful information? I asked. I watched it on TV. Actually, that does sound kind of familiar. Last year, Shumlin led the effort to raise over $20 million in taxes on the working families of Vermont. Healthcare costs for Vermonters are rising a million dollars a day. Families and businesses are struggling, and there is a direct line between skyrocketing costs and insurance company profits. That's why Vermont needs a single payer system. So after being so well informed by TV, how does he feel about voting? So who do you think I should vote for? Um, I don't even think I should vote. And there you have it, the wonderful effects of negative political ads. In the run up to the most recent... Um, so that was literally the same day. And I went um, to graduate school at St. Mike's and I, I uh, approached my professor. I had spent four months developing a, a capstone research project. And I walked in and I told him, I said, I needed to change everything. I, I've, I've got to do something about this. Um, uh, young people, the, the, the level of cynicism, apathy and disengagement was just absolutely shocking. And um, James Nagel, great professor at St. Mike's, smiled, nodded, and said, okay, let's get started. Um, so at Harvard, I don't, don't co-teach, and so I reached out to the only other people in the room that could help me with this problem, which, was, which were my students. Um, they engaged in some really amazing social research. They did a bunch of, um, they interviewed a whole bunch of young people and created videos and acted as partners in our quest to better understand why young people were so disengaged. Through our research, we developed some preliminary understandings of what, may, what might be causing youth in action, and most importantly, what schools might be able to do to help. Um, we'd, I developed some action steps that I hope to deploy in the classroom, and I'm not gonna get into the details. We can talk about that later if you have more time, but a couple of key things that I really realized, um, number one, Creating the space for strong youth and adult partnerships in the classroom has been uh, instrumental. Treating students as partners in the learning process, absolutely essential. And number two, um, I was and continue to be a huge proponent of proficiency-based teaching and learning. I know this term means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but in my opinion, one of the key tenets of proficiency-based learning is that we strive to create powerful learning experiences where students are performing real world authentic tasks, where students are doing science, not just learning science, and doing civics and not just learning civics. Um, this experiential learning process of memorization, application, and reflection is a critical concept, and if, especially if the goal is, is deep learning. So my desire to create a curriculum of hope where students were actually performing civic responsibilities led to the development of a civic action project where students were encouraged to act as global citizens 
by addressing a need in their community. Now, for some students, that's meant high-level lobbying for political issues they care deeply about, organizing rallies and doing really amazing things. And for other kids whose community is a lot smaller, it's meant talking to them you know, in a really real way about what, what's their life going to look like after high school and what is their path and where do they see themselves 10 years from now. Um, you know, that's the work that a modern civics teacher does. I will refrain from calling this issue a crisis because language like that is so often used to push forward policies quickly and at times without careful deliberation that we should take that should take place. As I teach my students, laws should not be created quickly or forethought. And I assume that's one of the crucial lessons that you would like me to teach students. That legislating takes time and that we have a system of checks and balances and separation of powers precisely to slow things down and ensure that the laws we create which often bear the unbelievable power of the state must, be must not be developed in haste. The founding generation of this country knew this, but not enough Americans seem to understand this critical idea that it takes time to legislate and that slow steady progress is generally more sustainable than fast fixes. Some of you may know that I work with a large group of young people from across the state in an organization called the Vermont Youth Lobby. The idea for this group began in my classroom several years ago when after a lesson on political lobbying, one of my students asked the powerful question, do we have a lobby? I asked her what she meant and she said, you know, young people, is there anybody advocating for us? We were both surprised to learn that there didn't seem to be any organization that was lobbying on behalf of youth. So she said, okay, let's start one. And that's how the idea for the Vermont Youth Lobby got its start. It's been one of my proudest achievements as an educator. And many of the students I work with are learning so much about the world through social media. Um, that it's important that we teach it in the classroom because what they're learning, particularly about climate change, has caused them significant concern. When we avoid discussing these issues in school, it does not mean students aren't learning about them. It only means their education is coming from TV as my seven-year-old son um, got his information and uh, increasingly social media. These students know what scientists are saying about climate change and they're determined to take action because they know it's their generation that will be holding the bill. They are justifiably impatient and frustrated, but it is my job as a civics teacher to help them understand how much actually has been done and why it is so hard to turn an entire country or state around. So nations are like battleships, I tell them. It takes time to turn around and they don't turn quickly. It's my job as a modern civics teacher to empathize with their frustration, but also remind them that when they ask for immediate action, what they are really asking for is not democracy, but something else altogether. When you ask for a quick change, what you are really asking for is the ability of a small group of people to have enough power to steer the ship quickly in one direction. And, and, and people powerful enough to do that can also steer it quickly into disaster. It's also my job to be honest with them about the state of our democracy and the many threats that exist to our democratic system, including the corrosive impact of big money, the manipulative impact of the mainstream and social media, the rise of political tribalism, hyper-partisanship, and political extremism. It's my job to help them be proud of their country and to acknowledge the great work that still must be done to achieve greater equity and justice for all Americans. Above all, it's my job to teach them how to take their frustrations and use it as fuel for informed, responsible, polite, and firm collective action. To teach them that the only thing that really does change world is a group of active and committed citizens willing to take precious time from their busy lives to push for things they feel are important. It's my job to teach them how the system works at many levels, at their school, reflecting on how democratic their school is, in their town government, in the state house, federally and globally. It's my job to teach them how we do things in Vermont and how it's often different than at the national level, to recognize that our legislators are simply hardworking average Vermonters, moms, dads, and neighbors, that all of you are doing your absolute best to make wise decisions that affect us all and that you grapple every day with limited resources and unlimited needs. It's my job to help them understand how a bill becomes a law, how average citizens influence the process, who to write to, what to write, and how to stand up for what they believe to be true. It's also my job to instill in them a sincere reverence for the truth and to teach them the critical, critical skills required to develop an informed opinion through quality research. I teach them what real research is, that it is an attempt to get closer to the truth through the examination of multiple perspectives. That we search for the truth in one perspective and we re-search for the truth in another. 
that it's not enough to have three sources if all of them share the same perspective. It's my job to model open-mindedness, critical self-awareness, metacognition, deep self-reflection, and to teach them about some of the universal biases that make us all vulnerable to manipulation. A modern civics course includes lessons on the constitution and government, but it must also include lessons on human psychology and conversations about bias. Students must be taught to acknowledge we all have confirmation bias, which causes us to actively seek out, more readily embrace, interpret, and remember things that make us feel good, and to avoid underplay and ignore the things that make us feel bad. It's my job to teach students that politics is like a bird and that for a bird to fly straight and strong, it needs a left wing and a right wing. To introduce students to insightful moral philosophers such as Jonathan Haidt, who argues that liberals and conservatives actually have many of the same values, but that they simply prioritize them differently. Mr. Henschen, uh, I, I just wanna let you know that we do have uh, some people that need to leave at four. So I do wanna get to your students. So I just, just please keep that in mind. Yeah, I only have another 30 seconds. Okay, great, thank so, you. So I'll, I'll cut to the chase. My story is definitely not unique. I wanted to explain the depth of what a civics teacher does, but I also wanna point out very, very importantly that um, there are a lot of teachers across the state doing this similar work. Yeah. And I'm sure there are many cases of individual students and groups of students who are still falling between the cracks and graduating without a proficient understanding of their responsibilities. Um, so we must do something. Um, I've got a couple key talking points. We actually absolutely want you to do something. Um, we don't want you to just sort of kick the can down the road. We don't think that you need to reinvent the wheel. There's some great, uh, Civics Now is an amazing organization and we strongly agree with their recommendations. We've summarized their 10 recommendations into just two things and I'll keep it brief. But number one, we ask that you make the space and that you mandate um, a, that you mandate that all Vermont students take the equivalent or experience the equivalent of one year of US history and that they uh, experience the equivalent of one year of civics. Um, the decision of what goes in those courses should be left up to those schools, but we want you to make the space, tell schools it is important. Um, there are a lot of reasons why civics has been, has been squeezed out of the curriculum. And just by making the space, we feel like you can, you can prioritize that work. And then of course, to invest in a long-term commitment by charging the AOE to create a serious multi-year effort um, to work with teachers and students to improve the quality of civics education in the state. Um, I put forward these ideas to a large group of teachers and uh, 143 out of about 150 teachers said, absolutely yes. Every high school student in Vermont should take at least one year of US history and one year of civics. Um, I would love to discuss some of the details, but I do wanna move on. Uh, I think the next student that's gonna speak is gonna be Uma Laker. Um, and I'm gonna hand it off to her. Great, welcome Uma. All right, Senator, may I make a comment to um, Matt? That uh, if it's very brief at this point. Yes, we are it is. Pleased. Harwood should be very honored to have him on his staff. Yes. On their staff. Thank you. Uma, the floor is yours. Hi, um, I'm Uma. I use she, they pronouns. I'm a junior and I attend Harwood Union High School for half of my day. And the other day I spend at HCLC, which is otherwise known as the Harwood Community Learning Center. It's a- Uma, can you, can you uh, increase your volume a little bit? Okay. We're not, you're not coming through that. I have headphones on, so that's what my internet is. Yeah, I can take, let me take the headphones out. Okay. Um, can you hear me better now? It's about the same, but I think if everyone turns up their, their microphone, we could, you might be okay. Here we go, that sounded a little better. Okay, so I am, I am Uma Laker. Oh, I need to look at my thing. Oh, yeah. 
and I am a junior at Harwood Union High School. Um, I attend Harwood half the time and HCLC the other time. HCLC is a project-based um, student, I guess, student-centered program that Harwood provides. Um, I am, I just, first of all, I want to thank um, the committee and Mr. Henchen for both of you guys letting me express how important I believe civics um, education is for students. Um, I believe it is important for students to learn about their responsibilities they have as a global citizen and as a community member. I took CSC for the first time last year and um, this year I returned as a teacher's assistant. I was becoming more aware and in, involved and I started to value Mr. Henton's class and his goals as a teacher. Um, as I said, I TA'd um, this semester and the past semester. Um, I, last semester I created the unit for one of my HCLC projects. We have semester long projects and I created a unit about um, gender equity and feminism. And I co-taught it with Mr. Henchen in the class. Um, I have seen CS3, CSC through the eyes of both a student and somewhat a teacher. And every day I'm fascinated by how Mr. Henchen manages his class and how, they, and how the students respond. I believe we need to expose all students to education that isn't just teachers talking to them, but with them. I cannot explain how good it feels when, a, um, as a student, when a teacher can have open and safe dialogue with us. The nation is becoming more diverse and complex. Social media itself is a whole world that most adults really don't understand or aren't even involved in. The media twists words and stories and without the knowledge to be able to find the truth within all the lies, can, can, kids can easily be fed false information and easily believe it. We need to start sending kids into a world with a knowledge of how our system works, how to search for the truth, and how to engage in productive dialogue. This isn't something that can wait. This needs to happen now. It is our civic, it is our civic duty to prepare future generations for the world that they now live in. I personally felt after the shootings in Atlanta a week ago, I was recognizing the lack of education we have about the oppression of Asian Americans. I was frustrated because I felt like I was cheated. We learned about, we learned a lot about black oppression in history class, but racism is so much more than what has been taught in the past. New identity phrases and conflicts are popping up every day and the lack of education about the oppression of Asian Americans, the violence and oppression towards trans member, trans members within our political system and socially, these aren't necessarily new issues, but they are becoming more and more prevalent in our society. And it is a responsibility of politicians and teachers to create the change we need for kids to understand what it means to live on this earth. And just reiterating what Mr. Henchen said, we're asking you to create time within schools so that every student has the opportunity to um, engage in a civics education. And um, the AOE work with students and teachers openly about what we, I guess, what we as students want to learn and what teachers want to do. And that Great. is all. Uh, wonderful. Uh, Mary. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? There is a bit of an echo, but I think so far so good. Okay. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Mary Smith. I'm a junior at Harwood and I use she, her pronouns. Um, thank you so much, guys, for having us here today. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity, um, and thanks for listening to us. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was sitting in a classroom with Matt Henschen and two other stu students during a youth lobby brainstorming session, and he asked us whether we knew what the Senate filibuster was. 
Um, I had heard it before in the news, but it's sort of a weird word and like sounded too complicated for me to understand. And with all the other news and projects on my plate, I just didn't really feel like doing the research. Um, and Mr. Henshin, seeing that none of us knew what it was, decided to pull up a five minute video, just explaining it and its history. And explored, it explored both Democrats and Republicans points of views and how those views have evolved over the years. So immediately I understood how this new information applies to current events. Um, new progressive bills in the National Senate might not be able to pass despite Democrats being elected into the majority. The bills wouldn't be able to pass because the filibuster grants the minority, in this case, the Republican Party, the power to decide whether to even hold a vote. This seems to me to be a blatant disregard for the voice of the American people. So what does it mean to elect a majority into the Senate if they cannot wield any power to pass the bills after they sponsor, that they sponsor? So after watching this video and talking about it with my teachers and my peers, like I'm fired up. Right, I have a new understanding of how the US Senate functions. And now next time I'm watching the news, I'll be looking out for headlines pertaining to the subject. Um, I'll be observing which Democrats are against it um, so I can draft them a letter. And maybe I'll ask my friends to do the same after explaining to them how abolishing the filibuster makes the US, our national Senate more fair and just. So I share this personal story um, because it demonstrates how a quality civics education can change students' perspectives and ignite in them the motivation to participate in democracy. Mr. Henshin tells us all the time, democracy is not a spectator sport. It's, it's just, that's not how it works. Um, and so during this sort of youth lobby group session, like I may not have memorized the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, but I did write a letter to my congressman illustrating what he can do to create a more just Senate that better reflects the will of the American people. So through learning about the government and how to change it, I've gone and done it all on my own. So no one told me to, but only because I've realized the power that I hold in our democracy. Are you guys hearing me still? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah you're breaking up, but, but you're coming through. Okay. <laughs> um, so I've realized the power that I hold in our democracy. If teachers strive to spark curiosity and passion in their students through teaching them the true histories and complexities of America and exploring current events through the lens of change, this will drive students to want to participate in democracy. So while Bill S-17 does cover important topics, I'm not, I don't see immediately how it will create civically active citizens. Um, I don't really see how it would prevent another January 6th from happening again. Um, so I believe that there aren't adequate civics and US history standards really implemented nationwide or in our own state. So if you've watched the news the last few years, I think we can all agree that our country has sort of gone down a road that no one really expected it to go. Um, and to me, this indicates that something is very wrong with our public education system. Um, we do need to change this um, and Bill S-17 is a small step for that. And I really thank you guys for taking that initiative and like making space for us to all talk about it. Um, however, I believe that our efforts need to go far beyond how that bill is written right now. And so my recommendations are the same as Mr. Henshin's and Uma's, uh, that the Agency of Education establishes some sort of work group of stakeholders, meaning teachers and students mostly, um, to reevaluate civics in Vermont and um, to think about how the CivX now standards and C3 standards and the work from the ethnic studies bill can be better implemented in classrooms on the ground. Um, and additionally, mandate one year of proficiency-based civics and US history 
um, which gives schools the space to take action and really work this stuff out. So even though reevaluating the system might be sort of a tough process, I think it's necessary for the survival of our democracy. And so that's sort of what I'm passionate about and what I wanted to reinforce with everyone today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I re all really appreciate this opportunity. Great job, Mary. Thank you. Maya. Hi, I'm Maya. I'm also a junior at Harwood. Um, thank you for having us today. I also have a personal story to share, um, like Mary. So toward the end of my freshman year, I was presented with a choice between two history courses that I was required to take as a sophomore. As they were described to me by my teachers, one studied ancient, ancient civilizations and related them to the present, while the other looked at present issues and compared them to history and then took action. However, if you ask students to describe these courses, they'll tell you that one is harder with more homework, reading, writing, and higher level dialogue, while the other is easier with more hands-on and project-based activities. I chose to take the easier class because, not because I was looking for an easy way out, but because the content of the class was genuinely sounded more interesting and important to me. While many of my friends who took the other class spoke very highly of what they were learning, I've definitely not regretted my decision. The reality is that I ended up learning so much from being in an action-oriented class that focused on real-world solutions to real-world problems. It was really apparent from the first few days of class that most of the kids were not too psyched to be there. This caused me some discomfort and created a bit of tension in the classroom. However, the tension also provided me with an amazing opportunity to discuss really important issues with people who thought very differently than I did. I also credit my participation in the youth, lo participation in the youth lobby to taking that class because I'm involved in current and relevant issues and I felt compelled to take action. I've since realized that I missed out on some important concepts that students in other, the, the other class learned about, including a foundational understanding of our democracy and historical roots. They also had the privilege of engaging in some very deep, high quality discussions that benefited their learning in new ways. Unfortunately, the stereotypes that students associate with these two courses causes the makeup of each to be very different from one another. The courses are divided often by students' involvement and dedication to their education, which often relates to other factors and increases two homogenous and strikingly different classrooms. If we were all together in one classroom, all students would have the opportunity to challenge their thinking, build a strong historical understanding of our world, learn about relevant issues, have productive dialogues, and take action. Although our recommendations are to allow schools the flexibility to to determine what full year experience in US history and civics would look like, I would strongly recommend that schools create common experiences where students from diverse backgrounds can work through these difficult concepts and issues together. After all, if we can't get along in a class, how will we ever get along in the broader community? I can honestly say that without these experiences to challenge my thinking and the opportunity to discuss controversial topics and then the chance to learn about current events, I would not be nearly as involved in making change in our world. I would also have a more difficult time discussing important topics without the skills that I built in that classroom environment. If you let Vermont students go through high school without learning how to engage in productive civil discourse, being challenged in their thinking, or taught how to take action, then you're leaving us without the resources to become the next generation of leaders. If you let us go through high school without having deep discussions, learning about historical context, and reading timeless and timely texts, we might be ready to take action, but we'd be going into it blindly. If history repeats itself, but we don't know our history, we can't learn from it. It's clear that we need to do both of these methods to give students a comprehensive and effective civics education. But it's simply impossible to ask one teacher to teach students the history and how to take action in just one year. However, if every Vermont student had these learning experiences, our generation would be more adequate, adequately prepared to take on leadership and change making roles. But this cannot wait. There are students in Vermont classrooms right now learning the skills that they will use when they're in your positions. These are our future lawmakers and they deserve to know how to lead just as much as kids five years down the road. The longer it takes to come up with these solutions, the more students there are going through school without learning these skills.
By not taking action now, you're leaving current students unprepared for ending gun violence, climate change, pandemics, systematic racism, and so many other crises to come. Please listen to our recommendations to do something now. Take, make the space for at least two years of history in US civics and establish a civics working group to determine how we can collectively work together to strengthen the teaching and learning of democracy in our state. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my perspective. Great, well done, all of you, thank you. Uh, Maya, is, is, am I pronouncing your name correctly, Ms. Hines? Okay, okay. that was well, okay, terrific. Uh, Please go ahead and thank you for being with us. Thank you. Um, hello and thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you all today. My name is Maya Hines. I use she, her pronouns and I'm a freshman at Harwood Union High School. I'm also a member of the Vermont Youth Lobby. I'm here to encourage you to take strong action to improve the teaching and learning of civics in Vermont. In the fifth grade, I was lucky enough to experience an amazing sustainability course at Cross Upper Middle School. I'm not sure if it was officially a civics course, but I believe it provides a great example of what civics education in Vermont should look like. My teacher, Sarah Popowitz, worked hard to create individual relationships with each student, allowing them to connect to the content we were learning in their own unique way. The projects we worked on in class encouraged us to work together to accomplish real world goals, and we truly felt like we were making a difference. The student and teacher relationship felt less like a dominant relationship and more like a partnership. She helped students build off of their passions and connect to the content that she was teaching. As a ninth grader, I haven't learned very much about the concepts listed in Bill S-17. But what I have learned is that it is up to us to work together to make the world a more sustainable place. Growing up, everybody hears about climate change, but until this class, no one had ever explained it to me in a way that made it stick. However, when Mrs. Popowitz explained how climate change might impact one of my favorite sports, skiing, I became determined to do something about it. I learned what climate change was, what was causing it, and how we can help. But I didn't learn this from reading an article or listening to my teacher lecture in the class. Instead, we went outside. My teacher pointed out specific things that we could learn from. We looked at the compost bucket, the rivers nearby, and the solar panel field out back. We looked at examples of real world issues at our own school. In this class, we didn't just learn what sustainable farming was and how to raise chickens sustainably. We actually had sustainable farms and we did raise chickens in a sustainable way. This class was incredibly engaging to me. And looking back, I realized it was not only the lessons of this class, but the way it was taught that made it so enjoyable. We were able to learn about things we could all connect to in an extremely engaging way. Kids created a sustainable business called the Cougar Co-op that sold the food that we were growing and cooking. Students raised a lot of money from this business, which we were able to use for other projects in the future. Through this, we learned the benefits and importance of sustainable farming and how to run a small business. With Sarah Popwitz's guidance, a few friends and I ended up organizing a community event that helped to educate the local community about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We held a raffle for sustainable products and all the proceeds went to sponsoring a little girl in India. I believe that all civics courses could have this same effect on students if they were taught similarly. Sarah Popowitz gave students options to expand their learning in pretty much any way they wanted. This kind of teaching leads to learning and activism. It encourages students to speak up for what they are passionate about and make a difference in our society. It is what I am doing today and what I will continue to do. Recent events have clearly shown that we need effective civics courses for all students. Something must be done to prevent events like the Capitol raid from repeating itself. Students need to be properly educated on our government so they can understand what they can do to affect change. I believe that teaching civics courses through meaningful experiences and hands-on projects rather than lectures and tests is the best way to solve this issue. I believe that there is not enough engaging civics courses taught in Vermont. I would strongly recommend the state to invest in teaching educators how to teach in a more experience-based way. Students can get so much more from these kinds of classes. They can leave the class with not just new knowledge, but also new experiences. I also recommend modifying S-17 so that students are not required to pass a test at the end of their civics course. I think that there are so many more effective ways to teach students than through test-based learning. S-17 includes very important content that should definitely be taught. I would just ask that we consider the way that it is going to be taught. Thank you for having me and listening to my perspective. Excellent. 
Uh, well, you were all incredible. And uh, it certainly gives me a lot of hope and excitement that you are coming up in the ranks and uh, going to be taking over for, for all of us uh, at some point. So that was terrific. Uh, senators, uh, committee members, uh, questions for our, our guests. Senator Lyons, please. So thank you. You are all so articulate and um, you, you've just done an excellent job. And I just would like to congratulate you and your teacher for, um, for bringing you here and bringing your uh, outstanding speeches. But I, I do have an a, a question and that is um, your classrooms, how, how diverse are, are the students in your classrooms? I mean, do you have a, a, a di diversity of kids who are going to college, not going to college, um, or is it pretty uniform in, in who you're interacting with while you're learning about um, history and democracy and civics? Matt, who best to answer that, knowing uh, your students and what grade level they're in? Oh, you're muted, Matt. Yeah, I think most of them can, can answer it with the exception of Maya, who is in ninth grade and has yet to take the civics course next year. Okay, Mary? Sure. Um, so you ask about the diversity of our civics classes. Um, so Maya George sort of addressed this a little bit. Um, so at our school, there are two different classes. There's three democracies that you can take, or you can take CSC, which is creating sustainable communities. And um, creating sustainable communities is more project-based, project-based, action-based. Um, and like she said, I think you said it really well, um, using like present, connecting the present to the past and three democracies is more connecting the past to the present. Um, and generally I would say the three democracies class gets sort of a reputation for hardworking kids, um, maybe kids will, who will seek um, higher education, um, maybe whose parents went to college, um, that sort of thing and I'd say, I guess the opposite for CSC. So I think that's one place where we see like a real divide in kids um, in our school. Um, I, I see that as an issue. I think we all see that as an issue. Maya, George, do you wanna add anything? I feel like you may have been more fit to answer this question. <laughs> I think you answered it pretty well. Um, yeah, we don't, that's probably um, like, between those classes, probably the starkest example I can think of, of like a difference between the classes and class-based diversity is probably the most diverse Harwood gets. We don't have very much racial diversity at all. I would say, yeah, I would say in a nutshell, um, that's an issue that our department has been working through as, as sort of an, an equity issue and we're either looking to combine the courses or to um, have every student take both courses. And that's as part of, as sort of thinking about part of this work too. Um, I think what Maya shared and I tend to agree with is, you know, when it comes to civics education, it, we, need, we need to bring everyone together. It really rep needs to represent all, the, all of the diversity in our, in our school um, so that we can learn how to work through issues. And so we've recognized that as an issue and we're, we're doing our best to address it. So a few takeaways uh, for me, and I, I'm wondering, Martha, if you could just weigh in on this um, as much as you're, you're comfortable with it. I mean, first, it sounds as though everybody, uh, all of our students and, and Matt all agree that, you know, coming up perhaps at some point with working group, whether it's formal or informal, to continue these kinds of discussions, to kind of create curriculum, make everything that's happening in the classroom as dynamic and as exciting as possible um, and as important as possible is essential. The other piece uh, is that uh, 
students feel as though, you know, having a, a US history requirement and a civics requirement uh, is important. And I'm, I'm wondering, Martha, if you wouldn't mind saying something ab about that, uh, you know, where we're at with those kinds of things. I mean, I, I know we have standards, but if you have any response to that, that'd be helpful. Um, to the first piece, um, it all sounded very much like um, work that was going on based off of the C3 standards with the inquiry, you know, the, the content knowledge and application and awareness and relevancy um, and um, the evidence and the action. And I think that's what all four of these students talked about. So that is very much C3 standards based, which again, were adopted um, in 2018 by the state board. I think the big difference that maybe some SUs and SDs haven't completely um, transitioned to the C3 yet is that action piece. You know, the old GEs were very similar um, in scope from what I've looked at, because I wasn't here, but the action piece was the big difference between the old standards and the new. And when we search, that was one of the questions that we asked um, on the survey and not all educators or all responding curriculum directors said that they were using the um, C3 standards yet. Um, in regards to your second question, should US history and civics both be taught? Well, Title 16 basically says that with um, its US history, US government, Vermont history, Vermont government. Um, and that's in there in I think chapter 23. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. Um, both should be, both should be taught, learned. Can, learning I, can, I, can yeah. I clarify, Martha? It's my understanding that the, that, that you know, we've had this conversation, I think, before that it's, it says that students should be taught history, including U.S. history, civics, Vermont history, but it doesn't specify that schools, you know, have to teach a U.S. history course or a um, civics course, and that, and that that is up to the local school boards to determine. And I, I actually believe that most schools across the state already have a U.S. history requirement, it's my understanding. Um, not, I'm not sure, I think the civics requirement would be the, 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 the bigger change. They may or may not have that as a requirement. It might be an elective, it might be only a half a year. Um, but I, I, guess, I guess that's my, my point is that there are, there is, is, and I'm not, an, um, I'm an advocate of proficiency-based learning. I'm an advocate of a lot of the changes that the state has made. I'm a huge advocate of the work. And I think a lot of, as um, Martha re refers to, is a lot of the the work, the project-based work, and the actually doing, it, it comes from proficiency-based standards. I will say, however, that a dark underside of that is that um, it does not necessarily require classes and it does not necessarily require content. It focuses mostly on skills. And, and you know, there are a lot of people that will say, hey, it's a media-rich society, kids can just Google stuff. But again, as I, as I noted, you can't Google what you don't know, what you're not aware of you know, it, it, content is important. And so I think by having a, a, a mandate that you have to create an experience, at least a year in this and a year in that, I trust the great majority of schools would do a, would do a hell of a job, you know, creating really strong classrooms. And again, that's not the ceiling, that's just the floor. You know, that's just the minimum that we would expect. We love the fact that C3 standards is pre-K through 12. It should be, it should be integrated throughout just like writing is. Um, but we would just want to, you know, we think, you know, when we went to a proficiency based system, the other thing that happened is um, classes in a lot of school districts got longer and fewer and longer classes meant fewer blocks, which meant fewer opportunities for courses and electives. And then with the emphasis on STEM, civics kind of got squeezed out in a lot of schools. So by making this space, you're saying, you know, this is important. You, you know, we'll leave it up to you, professionals in the AOE, to determine what you do in that course but make the space, you know, and we, I would just feel very strongly that that could have a huge impact. Um, Senator, could, 
Uh, one second, please. Uh, Senator Terenzini. Thank you, Senator Campion and uh, Matt, and uh, to all the students, thanks for coming. It was great to hear. Uh, this is a subject that I'm very passionate about. I'm one of the co-sponsors on, uh, on this bill. And I think that if you look at democracy in Vermont, you know, you, many of the students have talked about um, D.C. and what happened on um, January 6th and so on. I think if you look at this bill, uh, specifically, this is the beauty of a democracy in Vermont is that I'm a Republican. I'm the only Republican on this committee. And I am a co-sponsor with several Democrats. And that's the beauty of the of the of the democracy that we that we live and work in in Vermont, because we can we can agree to disagree on certain issues. But we all believe that we're doing what's best for Vermonters. I just introduced a bill today on the Senate floor that had four Republicans and 15 Democrats and progressives as co-sponsors. So then again, there's another good example of how we come together to work on things um, that um, matter to Vermonters. And, and I think, Matt, you mentioned it, that um, Republicans and Democrats in their heart of hearts, really, we, ha we want to get to the same place. A lot of times it's just how do we get there is the different road traveled. Um, so my question to the students are, in any of your political science or civics or history courses, do you ever take an issue or a subject and then dissect it and look at it from a liberal standpoint and then look at it from a conservative standpoint to see how someone may decide to, um, to support or not support an issue? Maya George, do you want to uh, weigh in on that? I can think of a specific example. It wasn't actually in my civics class, but it was in my global studies in ninth grade, which is a required course at Harwood. And um, we, I think we took a test on online that told you like where you fall between like liberal and Republican and like this whole spectrum. And then we went on a website and researched an issue like a current events issue I think we all researched a different one and the website told you what like where the article leaned whatever you found and so it was like um if you were to search up the January 6th riot I you could find it would tell you an article from the very far right and the very far left and then like moderate and you'd be able to read the different opinions and I thought it was really really interesting and then that work did continue in my civics course with Mr. Henshin last year um, yeah interesting uh Senator Terenzini I see Uma has her hand up I don't know if you want to respond yeah. first uh yeah please um uh, uh, my very very great I appreciate your answer and then Uma I'd love to hear yours great Uma uh you're muted Uma uh Uma, it sounds like a great idea. I mean, it, you're, I can tell you're enthusiastic, but we just can't hear you. Anybody else want to jump in? Matt, do you want to give an example of something or, or a class? No, we can't hear you either, Matt. Uh, oh, can, can you hear me now? Oh, perfect. There you go. Um, you want to mute yours? I don't know. So it's darn Chromebooks. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to say that during my first semester, yeah, EAing in Mr. Henson's class, since it was during the election, we did do a lot of political biases and political tribalism, and we looked at the different. Um, viewpoints of conservative liberals libertarians progressives and we did specifically talk about we've talked about even a little bit vermont's progressive party and how vermont stands out on that way um so i know that a lot of kids are i know that mr henshin tries very hard to look at all viewpoints and let kids discover their own i guess stance on issues and doesn't you know i i really appreciate it when teachers don't you know, implement their own biases within their teaching and curriculum. He keeps it very open. And that really helps kid discover, kids discover what they want and what they believe. That's great. That's very exciting. Great. Senator Terzini? 
No, I, I appreciate appreciate the uh, the questions. I love to engage with high schoolers because you guys are the future. I would also say, you know, most Republicans I know, um, you know, did not would not participate in such behavior that happened on January 6th. So don't don't think that was a bad sampling of what you saw in D.C. That's not uh, that's not the Vermont Republican way. So thanks for being here. Well said. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Terenzini. Uh, Jess, you had uh, your hand up, or you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I guess I just wanted to to comment because I, I really do appreciate the the testimony, and I'd also just want to point out that it, it's a great demonstration of the the success of, of educational opportunities that are being afforded students, and particularly, I feel like what stood out for me is the role of the youth lobby as an extended learning opportunity, and how that really inspired. Uh, students to to further engage. I, and I, I want to recognize that there's an inherent tension in this. You know, we've heard a lot about January 6th, but I think we could also say that many of the architects of January 6th probably would have passed a civics education class. Um, and and so really we're at an intersection in which there's a, there's a lot of influences here and we're trying to solve a problem with a particular tool. I, I would just go back to, you know, certainly uh, we have state adopted standards that I think are fairly robust, you know, hearing that folks feel like they might tweak that a little bit, that makes sense. But I also heard, you know, Matt mentioned STEM and, and I think one of the unintended consequences of attempting to solve problems like January 6th with a, a mandatory class. And again, I'm happy to go back and do another sort around our classes because we have an enormous number of enrollments in US history and civics education uh, is, to, to what degree does that then cause uh, an unintended consequence of another you know, content area being compromised, right? So with the passage of Common Core, there was a lot of emphasis on English language arts and STEM, which pushed out you know, career technical education courses and pushed out civic education. And then at what point does someone say, well, now this new thing, comprehensive sexual health must be a mandatory course. STEM education or computer science must be a mandatory course. And then all of a sudden you start to create complexity in a system that is already complex and that's proficiency based. And so absolutely, you know, and I, I would wanna just say that Martha works with educators all the time. We work with educators um, and we, I think Matt, we met because we took the call, right? And engaged uh, in a conversation with you and, and we're always open for that. But I would just caution against the blunt instrument of a mandated class, and particularly, you know, uh, Senator Lyons, you know, comment about a democratic culture. There, there's a tension, an inherent tension, in saying we want to, you know, have student choice and a democratic culture, and we're going to do so by mandating a class and the passage of a class. And so, in Vermont, we always do this. We have freedom and unity on the flag, which I like to call frunity. You know, and, and to that degree, I would just hope that we would have some balance and understand that I think this is an implementation issue and not a legislative issue. I just, um, just, just to clarify, um, we, we, I think we agree, like we're like 99% there. Um, I, I think that I, I would, what I would say, cause I've thought about this is that civics is, is different than English, math, science, um, you know, maybe health education is actually a good idea of something that students should take. I know Uma has a lot of strong opinions on that um, because it is something that like, it is different. You know, every other course in some way is designed to help students sort of succeed in the world. You know, it's about them. It's about their success. It's this sort of individual model. Civics is not about them necessarily. Civics is about us. It's about the community. It's about democracy. And it's something that we all need to engage in. So I, I would say we're different. Um, and I think we deserve to be treated differently. Now, of course, I'm a civics teacher, so uh, you know, you, hopefully everyone else feels the same way about their own topic, but I would say that we're different. And, and the language we would use is, is, is that students experience, not pass, you know, not have to pass, but an equivalent of a one-year U.S. history and the equivalent of a one-year civics. Schools have a ton of flexibility over you know, whether they want to provide a common course, whether they want to provide more choice to kids, how they want to do that. But I, I do think that, you know, two years for democracy, 
um, is is okay. And I don't think that it's going to lead to a slippery slope um, of like more and more and more. And if it did, call me back and I can make an argument for why we're different. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And you're not you're not wrong. Yeah. Every company area sees their importance. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I, I'm not sure if you're characterizing, in my opinion, accurately, Senator Lyons' comments uh, and idea. I mean, it's as I took them, they're more what are kinds of the things that we can create in a school culture that, um, you know, that puts students at all different grade levels in the driver's seat in some regards. I mean, I don't think it's, uh, you know, uh, all of a sudden students are going to say, wait, you know, they allowed us to put in a new salad bar at lunch. Uh, that was our decision. But now they're coming on down, you know, from Montpelier that we have to take civics, you know. Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, again, we're trying to make cultural changes here. And I think giving students certain opportunities to weigh in, uh, you know, at the school level and, and vote and participate is, uh, is exciting uh, for one. Uh, Senator Lyons. So, yes, I, I want to say that I would not ever support a single class mandate. So, uh, it's the culture shift is what's so critically important and you and you can get that through experiential learning as you have all said it's just you know awesome but and sort of understanding the basis for a cultural change to toward um, democracy is respect yeah so and the the lack of respect that we saw in January 6th was just unbelievable so um how it's clear to me that your classes have uh, built respect and it's probably through a demonstration of respect for each one of you and others in your classes. Uh, yeah, it, it, this, has been, this has been incredibly helpful. Uh, Senator Perchlick, please. Yeah, thanks. Sorry I had to leave to go to government ops a couple times there, but thank you so much for the, the testimony. I really appreciate it. Mr. Hanson's work at, at Harwood, I think it's great. My own daughter participated and really uh, learned a lot from the youth lobby. Um, but I think that the, the issue that we'll have is kind of what Jess brought up is if you push here, where, what are you pushing off the table on the other side and how do we, how do we make sure we're not just loading more onto the agency of education that has a lot going on, um, but still provide the, the, the space. I think I heard both Henshin and several of the students talk about making sure we, we create the space for these discussions in all the schools throughout the whole state. So I'm definitely very intrigued and interested in, in how we can we can move forward and clone Mr. Henshin and put him in all the different yeah. school districts somehow. I mean, that could be the, that could be the investment that we need to make uh, is cloning Mr. Henshin. Uh, that would be STEM, STEM education. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I mean, part of what I'm hearing also is that maybe, you know, teachers, as much as we can, uh, we want to provide opportunities from te for teachers to learn from uh, one another. As Mr. Henschen said right in the beginning, it's teachers who are, uh, you know, in the classroom, on the ground. Uh, are there ways that we can, uh, instead of cloning Mr. Henschen, but get him in front of other teachers that so that he can play a role in in you know their uh, professional development and help and share ideas, and I and I think I heard that also early on from from Martha around you know are there things that we can do to you know create some curriculum uh, that teachers can access and I and 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 I think that's kind of exciting as well, Senator Persley. Yeah, and it, it's not too different from our discussions on literacy and yeah. like. Yeah. You know, there are some really good literacy teachers and there there might be some other ones that we heard of that, that got out of teaching school and realized they didn't know how to teach how to read kids how to read, you know, that they but but we heard a lot about coaching other teachers on how to do good literacy. And there are some folks that want us to have us require specific courses on literacy. So it's it's a similar discussion and it's an interesting thing for us to think about of what the role of the legislature is in, in trying to create this space and create the create kind of a top down approach on some of these things. So. Yeah, no, I think it, there's some really exciting possibilities. Martha, please. 
I was just going to say, um, we're, we've been doing precisely that. We've been having Vermont educators working with um, educators from Alabama and North Carolina on this piece in civic education and U.S. history project. Mm -hmm. um, so they can come back and, you know, work with other educators. And we also have the Vermont Alliance for the Social Studies, which, you know, we didn't have our conference this year, but you know, that's mostly other social studies teachers presenting the amazing things that they're doing in their classrooms. And, um, you know, between working, you know, having an opportunity for the AOE to be part of some, you know, work groups with students and educators, and it, I think it's great opportunities yeah. available. Can you see, do you, would you say where you're sitting, are there things that the legislature can do if, for example, you felt like we need to expand those opportunities, is it funding? Is it, you know, again, creating more spaces out, you know, during the summer where people can have, and you don't have to answer that right now, but, you know, that's just something where we can be helpful. And it sounds like there is already a structure in place. And, you know, just maybe that's something you keep in mind. Yeah. Um, and we provided suggestions for you all um, yep. to consider what, what your role could be. Um, in the Thank future. You. Yeah. I will say that um, Uma just said that it, you know, a lot of that work would, would be improved if there were more students at the table, which I would agree with. And I, I do really, you know, I, I want to say that the students in the youth lobby for years have been saying, we need stronger civics. We need stronger action civics. These are some of the best and brightest, most motivated kids that are coming from excellent schools. And they're still feeling like we need more. And I just, you know, like, I think Vermont is doing a wonderful job. And I think the C3 standards are wonderful. And I think what the work that the AOE does is amazing. And I, I think a lot of the opportunities the the social studies conference, but I'll be honest, I didn't attend the conference because I'm too busy, you know, teaching. I mean, there's, there's things that I, that I, that even I can't do. I just really, really want to push home how powerful it would be um, for us to make the space for civics and, and say, you know, as a minimum, as a floor. Um, and again, you can leave it up to schools to determine. Maybe schools give choices. Maybe it's a quarter here, a quarter there. Maybe maybe this course qualifies as a, a quarter civics, whatever. You're not mandating they pass it. So you're not breaking, I don't believe, the, the tenets of proficiency-based learning. You know, you're not mandating that they pass it. You're not mandating that they have to score a certain percentage. The, 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 it's still being assessed through proficiencies. Um, and and I, so I, I get it, and, and I understand we can we can make huge strides through voluntary, like sharing bright spots and encouraging people to do amazing work. And no matter how hard we work, there are still going to be thousands of kids that fall through the cracks in the state. And and I just I just I got to speak very strongly for those kids, um, those kids who, you know. Hey, they're struggling in this, or they're struggling in that. So let's let's just do this path or that path, or um, you know, I it's and again, I'm just going to do the strongest I can to advocate for 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 democracy and for education for democracy. We 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 cannot just maintain the status quo. We we can't, um, and we we have to do more. And I think making the space and 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 it is is a very simple act that the legislature can do to get the ball rolling. And quite frankly, teachers, most teachers will take it from there. But um, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how other students feel uh, on this topic. I, I know- I see a, Senate, a question from Senator Perslick. Did you want to weigh in on the Senator? Well, I had a question for Mr. Henson and on his proposal and from the students as well, from the one year of history and one year of civics. Could it be, like civics can be pretty broad and in, in what we even heard today is you could take a history class that's also a civics class. So I assume that, and that's part of what you're saying, I guess, tell me if I'm wrong is what you're saying is that each school or school district would have the ability to kind of figure that out. So they could maybe make it to where the history class is a civics class, or maybe they can make, there's a way to make uh, your math class a civics class, or, you know, just can you fold civics into other, other things and still meet the proficiency-based standards. Yeah, I mean, as long as a history class had social civic components from the C3, you know, civic standards, you know, absolutely, you know, or an English class or even a math class. I mean, you could combine those. So I think that's up to the school to decide, you know, we do 
we have a strong civic sort of unit in this piece and that's you to do a quarter here and a quarter there and a half there quite frankly most schools 99 percent of the schools are going to say we already we sort of already do this but i think it's going to force the conversation of you know how are we teaching civics you know, how are we teaching this where yeah. are we teaching this you know where are we teaching the c3 standards how yeah. are we teaching that because i will tell you i love those standards and i don't think enough people love them as much as i do um you know and i don't you know and i think making the space would go a long way towards um reconsidering those standards but. the other thing i'm wondering if, if we should be making the space for is you know i don't know if we've ever had a student-led summer study from the legislature one that we say to students of a certain age that they should be part in in the driver's seat uh as we are asking ourselves how to educate for a democracy you are at an age where you're you're going to be voting soon you're seeing what's out there you're talking to people and um that might be something this committee would be interested in cons considering you know, doing either formally or informally, um, creating that kind of, of, you know, opportunity for students, but also a real opportunity for us to hear back from them after, you know, a, a summer of talking and thinking um, about this kind of thing. I, I see uh, that we are, uh, uh, Getting, we're a bit over time in terms of where I uh, thought we might finish today. So I, I think we'll become, I know we'll be coming back to this in, in some way. Uh, what I would ask committee members to do is, you know, uh, let's prepare for a committee discussion on this uh, tomorrow or Tuesday. I'll look at the calendar just to sort of see what, what direction uh, everyone wants to go in. Uh, I can't thank Matt, you and your team. Uh, Representative Mook, Martha, and I know Jess left, but this was a really important conversation. And um, I think you can all students look back and, and hopefully say, hey, you know, we played a role and these, these guys and gals are thinking about some of the things that we, we said. And so thank you for that. And hopefully we'll also be able to have you look back and say, we helped advance something in some direction. So uh, with that, do I see any final words? I, I like your idea about a, a student-led summer committee or uh, you know study committee on this. I'd like to mention in the students to think about that. Yeah, no, I, I would be great if they would think about that. Um, and how these usually work is, you know, I don't know if we would even maybe be the first in the country to have a completely student-led and funded you know, summer study where we would be providing, the legislature would provide questions that we would ask you to come back uh, with answers uh, on sometime in January. So it's um, something to think about and um, something that we'll think about. But in some ways, I really can't think of people who would be better to help us, you know, make this cultural shift that we're talking, culture shift that we're talking about than those of you who are at this age and having the experiences that you're experiencing, so. Okay, committee, thank you for uh, a great discussion and thanks everyone. Uh, and we'll look forward to uh, returning to this conversation soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Uh.